Welcome everybody. This is our March 25, 2020 edition of the Power Apps Community Call. And we've been hanging out here for the last half hour with all the, the folks presenting today and talking about what we're going to see and we're all really excited about it. If you haven't been on our Power Apps Community Call before, let me tell you a little bit about it. So our Power Apps Community Call happens every single month. And during our Power Apps community call, we talk about the latest news and community contributions in the land of Power Apps. And we also talk to the product teams behind Power Apps who actually invent it. And they come on and show us cool things about the product that they're working on and we'll get to play with soon. We have technical deep dives of which we have a whole hat trick of them today. We've got three different folks on from the community who are gonna do technical deep dives on really neat things they've done with Power Apps that we can all benefit from. Throughout the call, we have Q&A, and, and I think we might even uh, probably not have time for a Q&A session because we do have three speakers today. So we do this call every single month. We do it on the third Wednesday of every month, and our next call will be on April 15th. That should say 2020 <laughs> at 8 a.m. Pacific time. So what are we going to talk about today on the Power Apps Community Call? Well, first, our agenda looks like this. We're going to talk about who's presenting, and then we're going to talk about Power Apps component libraries, how to use a Canvas app branding template to save yourself tons of time and work branding your Power Apps consistently, and also a video game called the Crossword Countdown video game. Then we'll move into the recent news and community activities and, uh, and go from there. So, who are your awesome hosts? Well, that's me on the left there. I'm Todd Baginski. My company is called Canvas. We're based in the Seattle area. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP and I work with Office 365, Power App, and Azure Technologies all the time. You can reach out to me on Twitter, find me on YouTube, or on my blog. They're all three listed here. So I put out a lot of content just like practically everybody else on this call does for the community on learning how to use Power Apps and making them work for you and having fun with them. And then our other awesome host, Chuck Sterling. How are you today, Chuck? I'm doing good. I work for a software company here in Redmond as well called Microsoft. Um, yeah, so you guys are a new startup, right? Hey, we've been around <laughs> a little bit, yeah. And Chuck, what do you do? Um, senior program manager actually run the community. So if you ever have gone to community.powerapps.com or if you've gone to ideas.powerapps.com, my job is to make sure that you guys have a good experience when you get there. Awesome. We appreciate everything you do for that. And we've also got on the call, and this is a monthly thing as well, in case you haven't tuned in before, we have all kinds of experts and gurus from around the whole world who tune in and help answer questions for everybody in the chat. So if you've got a question in chat, something you're blocked on with Power Apps, wondering if you can do it, wondering how to do it, does anybody have a code sample, whatever the case may be, feel free to reach out and chat. All these guys are here helping out. If you'd like to be part of the team that does this with all of us every uh, month, feel free to let me know. I'd love to put your name up here too. So thanks to all you guys for sharing your time with everyone around the world. Then we've got something extra fun this month. So I saw that TechSmith was, TechSmith put out a little announcement and they said, hey, if you run a conference or do any other things, you know, for the community and promote stuff, we would love to hook you up and your attendees up with some swag. So I reached out to him and I said, hey, I do this Power Apps community call with Chuck every month. And lots of people like to tune in. Would you guys like to donate some swag to our call? And they said, absolutely. So I've got some exciting stuff here today. I've got this TechSmith cool, coffee mug but what's even better that TechSmith gave us is what you'll find inside inside of the coffee mug i have TechSmith stickers and a free license to snag it and camtasia and so i don't know if you've ever looked up how much those licenses cost but this is a heck of a nice swag giveaway from TechSmith. so we would like to say thank you to our friends at TechSmith. 
I use these two tools every single day, actually, in my job for creating videos that you'll probably find on YouTube or just screenshots and communicating with my team and the folks I work with. So thanks again, TechSmith. And we will announce and reach out to the winner at the end of the call here today. So what we're going to do is look at the attendees in the call and then just do a random drawing from everyone who attended. So that's pretty fun. And I think we'll have that giveaway next month, too. So thanks, TechSmith, for hooking us up. All right, and that brings us on to actually the real meat of our call today. So we're going to start off here with Power Apps Component Libraries. And Reza, thank you for coming on and joining us today. I, I've seen you've already made a couple YouTube videos about this, but I actually didn't watch them because I knew I was going to get to see you do it here today. So thanks for joining us and I'll let you share your screen here and uh, take it away and let us know all about the component libraries. Sure. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. OK, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Power Apps component libraries. Before we start off with what are component libraries and why this concept was introduced, it's very important to first understand what components are. So components are reusable building blocks that you can enable for Canvas apps. They are useful in building apps that have similar patterns, and these components can be leveraged inside your app. You can also share these components to other app makers. And now with the help of component libraries, you can actually create global components that all app makers can leverage. So we're going to look at this in action in the form of demos. So the first step I'm going to take is I am in Power Apps. If I create a new app in Power Apps, and in this app I have two simple screens, a home screen and a task screen. Both the screens are empty. So the first thing that I'm going to try and explain is why components was introduced. Now in a normal app, you will always have something called as a header. So in this scenario, if I just add a simple label, if I just drag this across the screen, I'm going to fill this with the theme color. I'm going to center align this, just change the color, and just change the text to home. Gets me to maybe a very simple header for my app, right? I am an app maker. I just built one screen called the home screen. I added my header. Now, if I want to repeat this in a different screen, the normal pattern is you would either recreate it from scratch or you would probably go to the screen, copy the control and just paste the control in your second screen and change the header to task. Now, in this scenario, what I what I was able to do quickly is I was able to build header controls for my screens. Now, if I need to make any change to the header control, so let's say I need to change the font of my text in my header control. If I change the font on one screen, it's obviously not going to re reflect on the other screen. You need to head over to the other screen and manually make the change again. This holds true for any control or any property that I change within the header label. Now, if I have an app that has over 50 screens, you can imagine the amount of effort you have to make to change the header for your app. Also, in terms of consistency, if other app makers in my environment also need to leverage the same header, that is not going to be possible because they would have to go in and make that change inside their apps as well. So this could quickly multiply and there is no way for you to create a reusable artifact in Power Apps that all your app makers can leverage. And that's the exact reason why the concept of components was introduced in Power Apps. Now, components is not something that is turned on by default. For the apps that you newly create, you will see the components feature open up. So as you can see on the left hand side navigation under the tree view, I have screens. I also have components. If you do not see components, you need to go to file settings, advanced settings, and one of the experimental features is called components. You need to turn this feature on. This is going to go into GA very soon. Once you turn this feature on, you will be able to see both screens and components. Now I'm going to go ahead and quickly create a new component in this scenario. I'm going to call this a header component. 
Now, component also acts technically like a screen wherein you can add a lot of controls. But the beauty of components is that everything you drop into this container becomes a reusable artifact. So in this case, if I was to recreate that same header control, I'm going to add the label here quickly. I am going to center align this. I'm going to change the color. I'm just going to add my text here. And uh, that's it. I'm going to go back to my header component. I am going to change the width of this component to app dot active screen dot width and what is app dot active screen on any screen wherein I will drop this component it will pick the property of that screen so in this case I'm picking the width property of that screen and the height of my component I'm going to choose 70 pixels for the height of this control for now and my label is sitting right here now if I go to screens and I come back to components you will notice that it has taken the height of 70 pixels and the width that I have defined. So here's a very simple component that I built. Now components also have something called as properties which are extremely important. There are two kinds of properties you can create in components. One are called input properties wherein you can send data to a component from a screen. And the second is called output properties wherein you can actually output data from a component back to your screen. Now in this scenario, I've created a label. Of course, the text of the label is going to change when I drop this on every screen. So I'm going to create quickly create a property for my component. I'm going to call this header text. That's the name of my property. It's going to be an input property. And as you can see, you can pass a lot of data types into your component, and you can also pass a lot of data types out from your component. In this scenario, I'm just going to create a very simple text property related to my header text that I'm creating. I'm going to click on create. This creates a property that I can use inside my component. I'm going to default this to header. And for my label, I am going to change the text property to header component dot header text. Now if I head back to my screens. Let me try and center align this again. So now if I head back to my screen, I'm going to remove the header labels that I created. And instead of that, I'm going to leverage the component. And in order for me to leverage a component, I need to go to insert. You need to go to custom and I will see the component that I just created right here within the app. So I'm going to pick this header component. I'm going to do the same thing for both the screens. And now this component has a property called header text. This was the input property that I created. So I'm going to call this home for my home screen. And for my task screen, I'm going to change this property to task. Now the advantage of components is if I want to make any change and it's reusable, right? So if I head back to my component and this time, let's say I change the font or if I go ahead and change the color of my component, if I head back to my screen, you will notice that both the font as well as the color has changed. That is because both the screens are pointing to the same component that was created locally within the app. This is a very simple example of components. Now these components can be exported and imported to be used across apps. But the problem is when you export and import components using this approach that I just showcased, the issue here is every app maker will have his own independent copy of a component. We don't get the truly global experience of components wherein we just have one master instance of a component and all the apps refer to that component. In order to achieve that, the new concept of component libraries was introduced. So what is a component library? If you go to make.powerapps.com and if you go to apps, apart from apps, you will also see a new option called component libraries, which is again in preview. If I go ahead and create a new component <coughs> library, I'm going to call this uh, community community call. I'm going to create a new component library. 
Now, a component library is also just like an app. The only difference is that all the components that you create within this component library become global components. OK, now for this demo, I have already created a component library and in this component library, I have created a wide variety of components that I want my app makers in my environment to leverage. For example, I have a Bing Maps component. I have a header component, right? I have a dialogue component. I have an indicator component. Whatever you want to build that you feel is reusable, go ahead and build them as components in your component libraries. Once you build these components in your component library and once you publish your component library, please note component library is just like an app. All the features of an app are available to you. Once you do this, now if I go to, for example, if I go back to the app that I was showcasing before, I was using this local header component. I am going to delete this. I'm going to go back to my screens. This time I'm going to leverage the component library that I have created. Now, how do I leverage a component library? You need to go to the plus icon on the left hand rail. And you will see an option which says get more components at the bottom. Once you click on this, this will list out all the component libraries that have been shared with you as an app maker. Now, because a component is an app, you can share a component just like you share apps. So if a component library has not been shared with me as an app maker, I will not see that option right here. Now, because I have built these components and these components have been shared with me, I can see all the components that are available as part of the component library. Now in this scenario, I'm going to pick the header component so you can pick and choose which components from the component library do you want to use in your app? So I'm going to pick the header. I'm going to click on import. Now once I do this, this is going to insert a reference to the component that has been created in the global component library. So here's my global component library. I have a header component that I've created. This is my header component. Now if I head back to my app, on the left hand rail, once again, under the insert icon, you will see library components open up. And right here, I have the header component. If I click on this, this is going to add the header component to my screen. Right? So if I head back to my screens, this is my header component. I can copy this and I can paste this in my next screen as well. And once again, I can leverage the same properties that I have exposed as part of my component. Now, in this case, I've exposed two properties. I have a header text property and an app logo property, so I can even put a logo for my app. In this scenario, I'm just going to keep it simple. I'm going to call this my home screen. I am going to call this my task screen. Very, very simple. So instead of me hosting the component locally in my app, I am leveraging the component library and leveraging the features that have been globally deployed as part of the component library. So three things to start working with components. You need to activate the components feature in your app. Second, my recommendation is to start using component libraries and not use local components. In fact, if you look at uh, the roadmap components that are being created locally, there are plans to deprecate that feature as well. So highly, highly recommend start using component libraries so you can create global components. Now, of course, I didn't want to show you such a simple app like where just a simple header component is dropped in. So I used or I have created two apps. One of them is a an app that I have shared in the community. It's a coronavirus uh, tracking uh, app. It's a very valid app in today's times. And uh, I also created another app using one of the existing templates that are provided. It's the service desk template. And what I was able to do in these apps, I was quickly able to use components that I globally created in my component library. So for example, if you look at the service desk app in question, in this case, I have multiple components here. I have a left navigation component that I created. So as an app maker, all I need to do is just drop the component into my app and I have a left navigation ready for me to reuse. Consistency, branding, governance. Second, 
I also have a header component right here that is showcasing the header in my app. Now, if I move through the screens in my app, for example, if I say I want to create a new ticket, once again, another screen that has the same components, and these components are coming from my component library. If I head over to another app that I'm leveraging, in this case, this is an app that uses the tablet experience, as you can see. The components that I've designed are responsive in nature, so I can leverage those components even in a tablet app. So in this scenario, once again, I have the same consistent left navigation for my app, and I have the header component that I have fixed on the top. The map component, so the big map that you see in the center is also a component that I have created, and that is also coming from my component library. That means anything that I want to reuse within apps across my tenant, I can build a component for that purpose. That would be a great candidate. Okay, now I've built an app. I have two apps in question here, but what if I want to make a change? How does that work? So if I head back to my component library, just like I made a change before, I'm going to go to my component. And in this case, let's say I'm going to make a very simple change for the purpose of this demo. I know I'm running short on time right now. I'm going to change the background of this to purple. OK, so I just changed the theme of my header component to be purple. Now, once you make a change to a component in a component library, you need to ensure that you go ahead and publish it. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and save. And I'm going to publish. OK, any change that you make, you have to publish in order for the apps to be aware that a change has been made to a component in a component library. Now in this scenario, I've gone ahead and made a very simple change and published the component library app. Now if I head back to my apps that I have in question, you will note that they have not changed, right? The header component still is showing the blue color. The reason is because me as an app maker will get notified, okay, that there is a change that has been made when I edit this app again. So if I was to close this app and if I was to re-edit this app, I will get a notification pop up which tells me that a change has been made to this component. The other way is I can go back to the plus icon and right here on the top, it's very difficult to catch this. There are three ellipses right here. If you click on this, there's an option called check for updates. So it basically checks to see if there are any updates that have been made to any of the components that you have included in your app. If I click on this, this is going to tell me that yes, there was a change made to this component library at this date and this time. When I clicked on save and publish, I had the option of putting a version comment. Had I put a version comment in there, that comment would show up out here. So best practice when you make a change to a component, make sure you put a version comment in there so that the app makers who are going to incorporate the updates understand the changes that are coming in. Now in this case, I just made a very simple update. So if I click on update right here, this is going to go ahead and update the components that I have installed in my app. Now if I play this app, you will notice that the background of my header component has changed to purple. Same thing for my other application. This is not going to change by default. I have to go back. I have to click on check for updates and it's now my decision as an app maker whether I want to incorporate those changes or not. If I do, I'm just going to click on update. This will go ahead and update all the references of that component within my app. So as you can see, the header has, has changed color. And if I go to other screens in my app, the same behavior is going to flow through. So this is an example. I hope this was uh, helpful. This is a very simple example of uh, components. Todd mentioned about my YouTube channel. I'm actually demoing each and every component that I've built here one by one by one. So if you're interested in knowing more about components, I will highly recommend you to follow me. Additionally, Microsoft has put out 10 reusable components, and this was put out, believe it or not, in 2019, in Feb of 2019. That's how long components have been around. There are 10 reusable components that you can take advantage of that Microsoft has put out, so you can go leverage these components, put them in component libraries, and use them across all your apps. Also, if you feel 
you want to be associated with the community, which you should be. If you go to the community site, there is a section called Canvas App Community or Component Samples. Many samples have been put out by the community that you can leverage, right? For example, here is a calendar component, a reusable calendar component that has been put out by my good friend Hardith, right? Even I put out my left navigation component. So the left nav component that you just saw me showcase, that is also put out as part of the community. So feel free to go ahead, check out what the community has built. If you have built something really interesting, go ahead, put that component out in the component gallery, and let's get this started. Thank you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Great, great. And, and there. Thank, thank you for, you for starting. starting. I love how you started with why the heck do you want to build a component in the first place? And uh, a few eagle eye things there, that refresh button, so you don't have to close and open it again. Everybody really liked that one. And so when I didn't know that you couldn't insert with the plus button every page, you demonstrated copying the component library component and pasting it. So no, you could. You've obviously you seen that. that that works OK. No, that works. That works OK. You can also insert using the plus, but uh, yeah. I'm too used to copy and paste. So that's what I did. That's great. That's really nice. So I have a question for you about um, what happens when you develop one of these in one environment in a component library, and now you're ready to go to your next one. What's your story with that currently? Great question. So. Currently, component libraries are not a part of solutions. Mm -hmm. And additionally, exporting component library, because it's an app, yes, you can export it and import it, but uh, there are certain issues right now. It's an experimental feature. Yeah. Very soon, there will be capabilities coming in where you can export and import. So right now, unfortunately, you will have to export independently mm -hmm. each component out and go into a different environment build your component library and import it. This is the scenario today, but very soon this is going to change. OK, so if you're in a very structured environment with a lot of ALM, th that might be a deal breaker for the time. It sounds like for the time being, but for the time being, down yes. the road, it's going to yes. get into a good ALM story, it sounds like. That's true. Awesome. Very good. Love your example. Thanks for sharing all that. Thank you. There we go. All right. Thanks again. Let's jump into exciting day here today. All kinds of neat things to show. All right. Todd, Todd yeah. maybe I'm misreading this, but I think Belinda said that you look boring. Show us our cute son. That's what I read. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> see the chat now. You're getting compliments, Chase. Um, all right. <laughs> so our next um, our next uh, piece of the puzzle here today is Sancho. Sancho, thank you for joining us here today as well. You're going to talk to us about your Canvas app branding template, huh? Yeah, thanks for having me. Looking forward to seeing that. I will let you go ahead and take over the screen share here and just give everybody a little introduction to yourself and let her roll. Okay. My name is Sancho. I make all sorts of power platform solutions at a company called Pinnacle Group. I do the internal work for them. It's not like we build for anyone else. Um, I'm also a super user on the Power Apps community forums, and I'm one of the Power Apps champs. So, wh what is the problem we th I think we're facing? The problem is we spend so much time changing all the controls in every single app, just just hours and hours and hours, and then you, you expand that out collectively over the 2.5 million odd Power Apps developers, and it just ends up being massive amounts of times. So if you spend like one hour in your career, and we expand that out to all the Power App developers, that equals 285 years of time we're all spending, which is just crazy. And then I do at least an hour a week of this in total, so expand that out, it ends up being like 13,000 years of time that we're all collectively spending every single year doing this. So there had to be a better way to do that. And the other problem is with color blindness and low vision. Um, so Power Apps Editor obviously has a lot of um, accessibility tools in it right now, but if you are colorblind or have low vision, there's no inbuilt functionality right now that will enable you to use an app that maybe someone has created badly. So if they created the contrast levels too low, you're not going to be able to see it. So I built a branding template, and 
I'll show you how I did that after I've shown you all the cool stuff. So let's get that loaded. So what I wanted to do was have a way for people to not have to spend that time branding all their apps. So if I create a new screen and then insert a few controls, Let's get a um, pen and put that's what I wanted. And combo box. And a date picker. So why did I do the date picker? Because right now in the editor, unless you build your own date picker with a custom component or PCF control, it's just not going to be able to to do what you want. So this bit here that's blue, if you change the colors of the date picker using the properties available, you actually can't change that. This will remain blue no matter what you choose in the settings. So right, usual process now is we'd go through and we'd change you know, the color, the fill, border colors, hover colors, and we'd match to our company branding and then you know possibly have a screen of these that we copy paste across to to all the other places we're going to use them. But what it really should be is it should be as easy as you watch me insert those controls. I'm not doing anything weird here. I go to a theme picker. So I'd be able to navigate to this within the app during play mode, not just edit mode. And then I hit set theme. And it's done. That is how easy it should be to change a theme on the fly when we're using the, the editor and when we're using it in play. Mode. That's awesome. <laughs> Right, so so, <laughs> yeah, that that's how it should be. Um, so let me jump back to my default theme. And right, so one of the other things I fiddled with was the pen input because as soon as you switch to a dark mode theme, you don't want that pen to still be writing in black. So if I swap out to back here, hey, there it is. <laughs> So it does that by <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I can't wait to see how you did this under the hood. And then the date picker is done. That was it. That's how easy it should be. It should just be you click, you change, and it's done. So I wanted to make that a lot easier for everyone. There's obviously some constraints. So I've worked with a primary, secondary, and tertiary color system. So, you know, light, medium, and dark, and built all the properties of these around those, but you could extend it further or change it to whatever you want to be using the way I did it. But we'll get to that in a bit. So the other cool thing I did was a, um, a chart palette. So if you want to change the color of default charts, we can just pick the color of that box, hit set chart colors, and it's done. That's it. <laughs> if I insert a new chart, it's done. <laughs> And then a theme tester, for example, I also included here, where all you do is change these three boxes to, you change their fill and their text color to your primary fills and text colors. You set a default label, and then whether or not it's dark mode. Dark mode only really affects the um, background. So if I look at the background of this object, you can see by default, it's appearing as if dark mode, then this color faded, otherwise that color faded. So if I insert a new screen, the same thing happens. If I insert a blank screen, that screen is now set to that fill. So anyway, yeah, so theme tester, you change a bunch of things here, like uh, let's make that one a purple again. It'll show you what that's going to look like if you use those three colors together. Instead of going around and, 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 and changing and fiddling all sorts of things, you, just, you should just be able to just go bam, 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 hit set theme, and it's done. <laughs> So the other cool thing is, um, so controls are obviously very cool. I'm not sure a lot of people in the more experienced side of Power App Makers probably use the new screens anymore, but anyone who's new to Power Apps is definitely going to be using these new screens, and you kind of want the same thing. So if I, let's go back to, let's go back to default theme, right? And I insert a new success screen, right? That's what we expect. And a new tutorial screen, excellent. Go to my theme palette. On this pop on a 
nice purple theme. And we go back to these screens and they're done. <laughs> so no more fiddling around and changing all the little bits and pieces and every single control. And yeah, that's, that's, that's what I wanted to do. And the fact that um, it comes by default with this accessibility theme means right out the get-go, even if you're just building a simple app, as long as you keep these two options, um, these two accessibility theme options, your app will be accessible. I mean, you can test that obviously by just flicking between by hitting setting theme every time you start building things, but it, it just enables that out of the out of the box. So for example, you can set this one. I've set a default theme of purple. Um, most of that is done on the app on start. So if I just expand that out, I've put comments all over it so you can go through and exp get explained how all of it's done. But effectively what we're doing is we're just setting six variables, three for the color, three for the text that complement those colors, and then a default label color. I'll tell you why the default label color in a second, and then whether or not it's dark note. So that's all we do. So all I did was set these colors to what was my purple theme over here, and, and that was it. That sets it to a default. So if I go into like the home screen, this is a one hour purple. I didn't show the home screen earlier, sorry about that. Um, and if I you can go back and set it to a different theme if you want, and it will pop that up. Then as soon as my app um, on start runs, it will default to that purple. So the loading screen itself is another additional thing I wanted to give people um, help with, and that was I want the screen to show you that things are loading and to set your expectations before you get into the app. So the idea was on the app timer, um, there's a timer in the screen and the timer will either navigate when the data finishes loading or when the timer finishes. So this runs for the length of the timer. Or the data loads beforehand, in which case it navigates. How did I do that? I mean, obviously this this is pretty crazy that you can do this out the box, but how did I do that? So if we look at a copy of an MS app, so I've got two different blank MS apps here. Now, if anyone, and none of you have used it before, Power Apps has an unofficial tool um, called the theme editor. Um, and with the theme editor, you can choose the colors of objects and create a default theme, but it's only a default theme and it's static because it's set to these RGBA values. So my theory was, okay, if we're able to use an app like this to create a theme and you can save it as a separate file that can then be imported, they must be doing some into the file which allows you to do that. So it's true, they are, and there is. So there's one that's made from the theme editor here. Now, something you may not know, um, MS app files are actually archives, so they're just a .zip file disguised as a .ms app. So you can open that up and see all sorts of content inside. Now, the one from the theme editor has a flat structure, whereas if I went and created a blank app from the editor, it's got folders and items within those folders. So. What I did notice was this themes.json file, uh, JSON is JavaScript object notation, that appears in these two places, and they are different sizes. And I had a look through them, and it turns out that if you open up that themes, looks like a mess initially. We use um, Visual Studio Code's uh, Beautify extension, and it will format JSON for you automatically, which is super useful. And I saw that your default theme is essentially set as a, as a series of JSON items. So we've got primary colors, backgrounds, C is for color, um, a few more down here. Uh, this bracketed thing here is an array. You can set default arrays, for example. E, I figure is environment variable, but I've, you know, working off guesstimates here, but that's for like font weight or alignment or that kind of thing. N for number. And so I thought, okay, there, there must be a way, if they're able to change this, this default theme for when you import an app, there must be a way for me to do that 
and there is. You just change these and you can you can create whatever you want out of them. But I wanted it to be dynamic. So my initial thought was I'm going to change it to T for a text variable, import it, and then have the app do some conditional logic. If this thing is equal to text color one, then make the color black or whatever it is. But what actually happened was when I imported it this way, it changed those T's into X's. So when I saved it down afterwards, it showed as X, which variable, but you can't import with X, you have to use T. So once I'd done that and I imported with T and I gave it a value like uh, one, that then interpreted that as variable one as a variable. Doing that, I was able to then create all sorts of custom items. So let me go down further inside, inside this themes of JSON, uh, somewhere down here. Default button style. So all the controls by default are mapped out here as items and you can change essentially everything. So I noticed that this is the one we generated from the theme editor app it uses color one which you don't see in a normal app that you save from the editor. You just see the RGBA value referenced up here. So that led me to believe, okay, I can change it to whatever I want really, give it all sorts of names. I could call it uh, Sancho Cool Variable if I wanted to, and it would interpret it as a variable as long as when I reference it lower down, as long as I reference it here as palette dot censure cool variable, it'll recognize it and set it to whatever I've given it above. So you could have thousands of additional properties here. And that also made me realize that it's unlikely that doing this is going to break Power Apps because the theme editor that the team released themselves does this already. So that's that's one thing to note. So now, okay, cool. Got that, you got the referencing, we've got everything set to variables. Then it was the really, really, really slow and painful process of uh, setting each one of these individual properties down the bottom here to red set every single thing one by one to red because it turns out as I mentioned earlier about the default label the default label is used all over the place inside these insert, insert screens so that's a default label but it's been given a specific x y value and width and height so if you change it too much or change it to something that's not compatible which is why I had to work out the dark medium and light for all of these things then in screens like um, the uh, meeting screen. These end up, these are all different default labels. So they end up using different properties and having different widths. And so there's a lot you can fiddle with. And if you're not worried about the default screens, you can literally change everything. I've done examples where I've changed the X, Y default coordinates for controls, the, the width, the height, the alignment, Every single one of those controls is controllable from inside this JSON file. So that's the absolute control. Okay, so what you can do is if you extract out that um, MSF file, you can actually edit all the properties inside it. So there's a properties.json, which has the app name, the author, all sorts of nice things. You don't want to change some of these, but there are some interesting ones you can change such as a test I was doing last night, you can change the default data source count to 5,000 instead of 2,000. <laughs> and because it imports it with that value, it kind of treats it that way. It's very weird. Then what you can also do is you edit the app using all these properties, and you can actually do manual insertion of controls and screens. So if I get rid of that and open up this screen.json and save it as inside that extracted folder in controls. Um, it is. And that's the key right there, right? You never actually unzip that zip file and rezip it. You put files back into the original zip file. Well, 
that was how I used to do it. But within the last few days, I've actually gotten a better way to do it. So this thing, I've got, it's, yeah. it's got a unique control ID of four. So I saved it as four dot JSON. So that is now a second screen. Um, let me just make sure it's got the right. Uh, so it's called cat screen. So in this blank app now, what I did was I used um, I think Gabs at Gabbers. He added um, a bit of PowerShell that you can actually use, and then I modified that so you can just run it and go. What do you want a call app to be called? I want it to be called Amazing App. It will just recompile this whole folder into a .ms app, and then I can go open and open up that app. And there we go, there's your inserted screen. And then I do the same with a button and insert it into this. At the bottom here, it's got children, so that's where you see your children items within a parent that is the screen. We paste in that button, which has unique ID 5, so the unique IDs have to be numerical as you go through. And then you look for its parent. Parent is set to screen two, which is what it was called before, but we changed it to cat screen. Save that, and we do that again. So let's get rid of that. And if I import that, Now, Sancho, have you talked with Microsoft about this at all? Have they kind of said, yeah, you're safe to do this and it won't break? Um, I spoke with a few people on the team, um, Manuela Pietler, Mehdi Slawi, and, and they, they've not explicitly said don't do this because the, the, the app they use, the theme editor, actually mm -hmm. does this just in a different form. So it doesn't do the inserting screens, but mm -hmm. it essentially changes the JSON in the file in order to give you that default theme. That, that's what it does. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is just an extension of what they were already doing with the theme editor. Yeah. And, yeah, and, so and I've, seeing... I've hacked similar things in there before, and, and I've received the same feedback, kind of like, hey, it is, yeah, we've done that kind of thing before too. You have to just be careful what you're doing, but it does work. I mean, if, if you, for example, if you break the JSON and create the file again, it just won't import. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced yeah. this. It just says error importing file, and then you have to go backtrack and find where you made that error. So that's, yeah. I mean, for, for, for this kind of thing where you're inserting screens and buttons, I wouldn't suggest everyone do this unless you want to do like an ALM or like really get into building apps programmatically. But for using the template, just take what I built and for example, if you put a new screen in and put a bunch of different labels and just set them to like primary color one, two, three, that's how I created these menu examples. All these are is a, is a gallery. In the back of the gallery is a background, which is set to the, one of the primary colors, prior mm -hmm. secondary color. And then all the other ones are just based on those primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. So I just, I just built these using those three colors. All it is is a gallery. So, so yeah, I'd say for, for, for entry level developers, just take the template I built, change the colors to what the colors you want to use, and then just build based on the tri color method of primary, secondary, or tertiary colors. If you want to get more advanced, then yeah, pick apart the, the actual .ms app. I just wanted to show how, how I did that because yeah. so everyone's always like, whoa. <laughs> well, there was a lot of that in the chat room. Yeah, like, what? Are you kidding me? This is amazing. Yeah, really awesome. Love it. Love watching this one. This is going to help out a ton of people. You know, the point I was making about the zip file, maybe you've seen something different. Whenever I've modified something in the zip file before, I've had to leave the zip file intact, pull out just the file I want, modify yeah. it, and then actually put it back into the zip file. Yeah. I found if I extract the zip file, modify the files, and then re-zip it, even if I give it the same file name, there's something that is getting done I, inside of that zip file when I the Power Apps team makes it on their server 
and it won't import if I zip it myself. Did you I can actually, the same I can, thing? I can answer that. Um, so what happens is when you use a, a function like WinZip or 7-Zip, it does the deflate function on the actual folders and other items inside the zip. Whereas uh -huh. if you use PowerShell, um, it ends up making a file that looks identical to the one that you would save down locally. So it doesn't do the deflate function and change the CRCs and all that on the actual folders and some of the items. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and thank you, Daniel. Yes, that was a trick, uh, a test I was doing last night. I agree, don't change it to 5,000. <laughs> I was just a test I was doing last night. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You know, I, that might be a helpful video or a blog on how to just re-zip with your PowerShell that you're using to do that. I, I have a lot of people I know reach out to me off my video I have on YouTube on how do you hack the manifest to change the background color. And yeah. I get comments every single week on people going, I re-zipped it. It won't import. Yeah. And so um, on, on the actual, um, I've put it up on the sample now. There's a link to my GitHub. Oh, is there? Um, we have just uploaded the .ps1 PowerShell file, so you can just run that from the folder. Perfect. It's, it's, uh, it's really, thanks. it's really only two lines. It's, it's. Um, yeah. It's yeah, just, you just have to know the magic two lines of code, right? <laughs> so it's, um, and I got that um, thanks to again to Gabs on the Power Apps community forums because he provided the initial PowerShell that I worked with for that. That's awesome. Very good. Lots of folks really excited about this one. Thanks for sharing it. That's the first time I've seen you do that. That's really <laughs> neat. What a cool app. Very you can good. See the really good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> how many? How long did it take you to do that? We've got an estimate of three thousand hours here. Ooh. Or uh, three thousand coffees, actually. Let, let's just say. He never lot. answers that question. I've asked him quite a few. <laughs> yeah. A, a lot of let's just say a lot of evenings over a few months. Uh, that's cool. That is really cool. Appreciate you taking the time to do it and share it with all of us today. My pleasure. Next time you get another cool thing, come on back again. All right. So I think we're going to go over our time a little bit, probably about by 10 or 12 minutes today, just giving everybody a heads up on that. And Matt, I don't want to rush you on this either. Uh, so take your time with it, you know, and uh, show us what you've got with the crossword countdown game. Yeah, cool. We'll keep it tight here. Uh, and by the way, uh, this isn't going to be just a straight presentation, so feel free to jump in with any questions there, Todd, and I'll be sure to answer them. I'm Matt Devaney, and I'm from Winnipeg, Canada. For those of you in the States, that's about an hour north of North Dakota. I work as an accountant, so I don't really make power apps uh, in my day job too much, but I do spend a lot of time outside of work making these power apps, uh, having lots of fun. And today I'm going to show you one of my little labors of love. It's called the Crossword Countdown Game. So this game is called Crossword Countdown. I built it completely with power apps. And as you can see, it's meant to be played on a mobile phone. When I first uh, started to make this game, um, I had a couple goals in mind. I was watching a lot of other awesome makers out there like Brian Dang and Gita and Karun making their own Power Apps games, and I really wanted to get in on the fun. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to make a fun Power Apps game that my wife would play. She's not too much into video games, so I thought if I was able to do that, I'd have a really fun game on my hands. So what I decided to do is take a few simple concepts that everybody already knew uh, from some popular board games like Boggle and Scrabble and kind of mix them together into this uh, one game right here. My other goal was I wanted to take an opportunity to learn a little bit more about components, which I think are going to be a big part of this Power App story going forward, as Reza showed us today. Uh, and also, I want to figure out how I could put more than 2,000 words into a single collection. And I'm going to show you how to do that using static data. So that was a, that's just a little bit about my motivation behind the game. Uh, so uh, as you can see here, here's the title screen of the game. Uh, all of these things are stock assets except for the background. That's just a royalty-free uh, image that I found on the web. So how do we play this game? The objective of the game is to score as many points as you can by building as many words as you can before time runs out. And the tiles are going to be displayed on a 4x4 four four grid, just like a boggle board. And then you have to make words, and they don't have to just be left to right or up and down in a straight line. Um, you have to click on the adjacent tile and try to build a word that's in the dictionary, right? So in any direction. You can also earn bonuses, and bonuses are laid out just like Scrabble. So 
you can get a double or triple word score or a double or triple letter score to improve your score there. And if you build a word of seven letters or more, you can get a 40 point bonus. So that's called a bingo. So here's what the little tile looks like right there. So I'm going to put the game on right now. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of sound, but I'm just going to show you a demo of how it works. Just a quick demo without getting too much into the power up side of it just yet. There we go. A little bit of countdown. So I've got seven tiles on the board here. And click on the letter T, I, L, E. That's going to be the first word I'm going to spell. C is pregnant out up here. Turn the music off right there. Okay, so now we've got the sound off. So just like Scrabble, uh, what's happened in the background is, is there's a whole collection of letters kind of in a mystery bag, and you draw letters out randomly and put them on the board in order in a four by four grid. So to make a word, uh, what you do is you just start by clicking on a letter here and it highlights it. I'm gonna build the word fog. So as you can see, it doesn't really have to be in a straight line. Uh, then I click the word score, and it checks it against a dictionary of over 170,000 words uh, to make sure that it's a valid word. So that's a, that's a Scrabble dictionary there. Next word I'm going to build here is the word pin. And you can see I'm running out of time. I've only got 60 seconds to do it. But this one includes a triple word score. It says 3W. So instead of just getting five points, uh, I'm going to get 11 right there for, for triple word score. And I will continue to make words until time runs out there. It's really unlikely that I'm going to get a high score today, <laughs> seeing as how slow I'm going. <laughs> and there you go. Time's up. So, oh yeah, what do you know? Uh, I did get a high score here. So that's uh, one of the systems that kind of uh, is incentive to play more and makes the game kind of fun. You can try and beat your own high score and enter in your own name. I'll hit uh, submit name here. And another thing that you can play for, oh, on this screen, you can see how many points you scored and what your best words were. And another fun thing that you can play for is I've actually put an achievement system into this game. Okay, so these are just like Xbox Live achievements or PlayStation trophies. You can get achievements for scoring um, certain amounts of points, getting bingos. Oh, I did get one achievement here. Submit a word with one second remaining. It's called buzzer beater, spammer, that type of thing. Um, I've also got a special one here called Clarissa's Revenge. Uh, if you score more than 247 points in a single game, uh, which is the world record high score right now, uh, owned by Clarissa Gillingham, uh, you'll get the achievement there. <laughs> so that's a, that's a quick demo of how the game works. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put this into presentation mode now, kind of a debug mode, so you can see more about what's going on behind the scenes. So I'll click uh, play again. So here's all the things that are going on behind the game. When I click that start button, I built the collection of all the letters that I was going to put into my mystery Scrabble bag. And then I drew several random letters and put them onto the board. So this is my current pool of letters that are in the mystery bag uh, right here. These tiles were all built uh, using a collection. And when I click on them, you can kind of see that OK, I'm clicked on this current tile right here. And I did click on a valent tile because it's uh, adjacent. So it's kind of detecting where I can click next. I can't click over here. It says the tile is, in fact, uh, like not adjacent. It's always kind of detecting where you're going. And you can also see that every time I'm clicking these letters, it's triggering this toggle up top right here. So all of the code that is executing in this game is basically going through a single uh, toggle, right? So I'm really trying to leverage the, the power of components here. Is there any questions about like how this game kind of uh, is is played or what the rules are? Or uh... I don't see any. Um, there's been discussions on delegation and the um, theming, but not so much for this. OK, cool. Um, so one thing that you might not expect uh, from this game is I've actually built all of this on a single screen. It's not readily apparent when we are just looking at it through the play mode. But as you can see here on the side, I've built everything into one single game screen. And I'm turning things on and off and going to separate screens within the game by triggering this uh, variable called current uh, current screen. So if I look at any single component here, like the points, uh, and go to the visible property. 
you can see that the current screen equals play and that's kind of where we are right now and when we go to something like achievements or high scores it just kind of toggles uh, on and off uh, i like using this technique when we are when i'm building a really small app but if you're trying to build something bigger and more complicated i wouldn't really recommend overusing it but when i'm in development uh, if I'm trying to edit a particular screen, I can't just go click on it on the side. I actually have to build this little pad right here, and that's how I cycle through to the, the title or the play screen or the how to play screen uh, as I'm kind of going through the game there. Actually, there's there are two questions for you. I, um, one is from Sanford Mosby, and he wants yeah. to know, are the tiles icons? Are the tiles icons? Oh no, the tiles are actually components. So I'll just click on this right here. And here you can see this is my little Scrabble tile, right? So what I'm doing is I've created a couple of properties here, like tile bonus, tile and tile points. And when I start the game, I load all of the information about the grid into a collection called WordGrid, and then I feed it into the component. So if I click on this tile right here and take a look up at the top. This is how I'm getting uh, information from WordGrid, which is this collection here. You can see it's just all my bonuses and points and values. And I'm doing a lookup based on the X and Y position of where the tile is placed on the grid. So I've got some pretty great reusability there. Um, was there another question there? That's interesting, Matt. I really expected that every single tile you had there was going to be part of a gallery, not dropped on individually. Yeah, that's uh, what Brian Dang said too. But the whole point of this game and making it was trying to learn more about uh, components. So I really tried to stick to that. It might have been easy easier if I was doing a gallery, but you can do it with components. And I've got a little slide about how I did that actually. So maybe I'll bring that up right now. David yeah. was just asking you to show that toggle, so there you go. Yeah. David, yeah. question asked and answered. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, I'm just going to show the toggle uh, inside here and make it visible. I make it invisible playing the game because it'd be too distracting. There we go. There's a little toggle. And then I'm going to go to the screen right here. So how do we detect which component was clicked? So uh, this uses all the same components as the regular game. But you can see as I'm clicking on any individual tile, it's really quickly snapping a toggle inside the component uh, back and forth. And it's using this outside toggle to kind of detect which uh, component was clicked. Because components don't really talk to the outside world. It's kind of like the saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens inside a component stays inside of a component. So we kind of need a special way to detect that. And you do that by just using, just using these two pieces of code down here. So in the default property of the tile, uh, you look inside every one of these tiles with an or statement, and then that's what flicks the tile on really quickly. And then when the tile gets checked, you want to go and check uh, which of these properties was actually triggered and kind of give that a name. So that's how it's working right here, A, B, C, D. So that was one of the kind of cool finds that I had while I was uh, making this app. I know a whole bunch of us like to use the toggle control with the default property and then run code in there like a function. This is the first time I've seen somebody do it, determining which component it came from. That's really helpful for everyone right there, that pattern. Yeah, yeah it was lots of fun uh, figuring out too. Um, I'll show you another interesting thing. So. Another thing I had to do for this game was put all the tiles in the mystery bag so that, and they're just like alphabetical tiles so that I could go ahead and draw one out randomly. And to do that, you have to make a collection of letters, right? So you have to write them out by hand. And it's super, super annoying to do that. So when I was first starting to make power apps, uh, this is how I would have made that collection, right? I would have done a clear collect and then I would have written each one out with squiggly lines uh, with value as the column name. About maybe three months into Power Apps, I figured out a better way, and I think everyone knows this as well. Uh, you can just make a single column collection by putting them between square brackets instead, and then just listing out all the letters that you want. But what I found out while making this Power App is there's an even faster way uh, using string split. So if I want to put all of the letters into a single collection inside my bag, all I do is I put them inside of a split, and my second argument is just two quotation marks, so split at kind of every position. And when I hit collect, uh, I get all of the letters in my collection right there, right? So the 
this code is actually sitting inside the onSelect property of this button. Clever. That's that's kind of like a college textbook, top to top to bottom on this page, isn't it? <laughs> Good, better, best. That's a really clever trick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and the other thing that I wanted to share was how I got 170,000 words into this collection because uh, I know that most people will think that the most that you can do is 2,000, but you can actually get more words than that into a collection by using either an iterative function, so kind of doing a loop, or by using static data, which is what I used in this, in this app. So static data is data that doesn't change. Um, there are things like words in the dictionary or things like a zip code. So if you want to use this type of data, like it can't be connected to a data source. It's just going to be stored within your app directly. How you get that into your app is you go to your data sources and you click on connectors and you search for Excel and then you'll find this handy import from Excel connector. And you can connect to any spreadsheet on your desktop there. So I'm just going to click words and dictionary demo. I'll open this, uh, open this up. Uh, here's what it looks like, by the way. Uh, each of the sets of words are stored inside of a table in my Excel sheet, and I've done this in 15,000 word chunks. You can only ingest 15,000 words in a time uh, into, into Power Apps via Excel tables if you chunk it up like that. So I've got 170,000 words, which breaks it into about 12 different tables there. Okay, so we'll go back to Power Apps, and then you would go ahead and just Click them all like this and hit connect. I'm not going to do that because I've already imported them. And then you can see each one of these is brought in as an individual data source in your app. Right? So then how do we collect it? Basically, you just use this code right here. You create your collection and you just put a comma in between each one of these data sources and it's going to bring it in all the individual chunks and put them into one. So when I hit the collect button here, It'll just take a moment. It's pretty big. We can see that we've got all the words of the dictionary in our collection from A to, uh, not harmonious, Z. <laughs> uh, it'll get there eventually, right? Down to Z. But over here, you can see that we have 170,399 words inside of the collection. And that's actually counting it using the function called count rows. Now, that's kind of neat, right? Because you can't use count rows in a normal, like against a normal data source because it's not delegation friendly. But because all the data is actually stored on our app now, we just have like full reign to use any function we want, count rows, sum, uh, just kind of you name it. And we don't really have to follow the delegation rules anymore. So I thought that was incredibly neat. <laughs> Question from Michael. Do you then use save data to not have to load each time the app is started. The uh, data, I believe, is already stored inside of the app, so you're not actually downloading it every time. Yeah. It's just stored right inside the app right there. Yeah, it's inside of what's downloaded locally to your machine when that happens. I wonder if you could use Sancho's technique and hack your manifest of the imported data so you could eliminate all the commas and the different dictionaries in the final one huh. to put it into one collection that it would start in one that way, you know, in one kind of data source instead of multiple. But mm -hmm. it certainly, Probably. if you're not seeing the slow download problems or anything, I doubt you need to go to that degree. No, that'd be pretty neat. Performance was a pretty big consideration when playing this game and, and checking the words against it. So I, I had to come up with a bit of an algorithm there. Um, so when you type in the first three letters in the game, it actually filters this dictionary down to words that only uh, fall within those first three letters, like Y-E-H or Y-E-L. And that kind of breaks it into thousand word chunks. So that checks it really quickly when you hit the uh, submit button. Uh, I bet the first time you checked that, you were like, oh, I need to figure out a better way, huh? Yeah, because it's not fun if it's slow, right? You kind of need that immediate instant gratification, kind of click, click, click. Totally, especially when you have that countdown timer going on. Yeah, it was kind of stressful, especially playing it live in front of anybody, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's my low score ever. Well, everybody really likes it. There's a lot, a lot <laughs> of kind words here about your app. That's so I think sure. 
think what I'll do is I'll so show everyone where to find it. So what's your next step? Then... So you're going to take this app and uh, rewrite it in uh, Xamarin or something and put it in an app store now? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> if only. Yeah. I, I hope when everybody plays it, they don't even realize that it's a power app, though, right? They just think it's a kind of a normal game. That would pr probably be the highest compliment I could I could have. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I know I wouldn't, just looking at it. There's no clues, really. <laughs> That's cool. So it, maybe I'll just show everyone where we can find it, and then I'll kind of wrap this thing up. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and download this game, uh, as well as Sancho's branding template that he showed earlier, just go straight to the Power Apps homepage, go to Community, then click on Galleries, and then go to the Community App Samples Gallery, which is the top one, and then sort by top kudoed, OK? Uh, so, by the way, there's Sancho's app right there. You can go ahead and download it. Uh, and my app is just a little ways down, down here, Crossword Countdown. And if you go to the bottom of this, you can just click on the MS app to download it and import it into your environment. Sounds there's a lot of great apps there. Outstanding. I have a feeling if, if you're up for it, you're going to want to enter this one in the demo extravaganza next time we do that. <laughs> Yeah, I might have to uh, maybe come up with something new, something new to show the crowd, eh? There you go. Let's see. Uh, so just just kind of close it out here. Why should you build a power apps game? Uh, I really love this quote by by Brian Dang. Um, so I mean, it's it when you build it really like you're not just learning how to build a game. You are learning all sorts of different skills that you can go ahead and take back into the business world. Uh, I can think of several applications for like you know static data and that that kind of toggle there. Uh, the whole point is it's not just for fun. You can actually learn a lot of things. Uh, but in in some ways, you get to practice different skills as well too. Like I probably haven't made an app with such a high focus on UX and I, UI before, right? Uh, something that just uh, looks pretty and kind of catches the eye. Just but just kind of in general, uh, I think that games are also a really great way to kind of showcase the power of, of power apps. Right, it doesn't always have to be about uh, a business. You can kind of have a little bit of fun too, and it kind of adds that uh, that wow factor. So, uh, that's the Power Apps uh, game called Crossword Countdown. Absolutely agree with all those points. I actually saw when Brian tweeted that too. Um, that was the first time I saw your game. Was that tweet on Twitter? That's really cool. <laughs> Thanks for sharing it. And yeah. you know, I, I think one more advantage or a good reason to build the game is you did things in your game here with timers going on, components, uh, all the different things you showed. This is a lot more complex than the regular line of business app we usually build in Power Apps, right? Yeah. It's just not just a form. There's a lot of things happening in in a real time scenario too. So I'm sure it really taught you a ton of things that go above and beyond what you'd use to build a typical line of business power app even. And that's the great thing about building something completely different. You're going to pick up completely different skills from what you do each and every day. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks again for sharing. Outstanding. What an awesome three presentations here so far today. Thank you to all you guys for coming along and sharing these cool things you've been working on. Here's a, a summary for everybody. These links have been supplied by everybody who presented here today. So here's the contrast checker and the color blindness simulator and the branding template that Sancho talked about. And here's Matthew's crossword countdown. Before we post this deck, Reza, I'll add a link to, um, to your piece in here as well. Our news is four news Items this month that are noteworthy. Uh, oh, actually, I already did add that link to your app, Reza. I just put it on this page. So your coronavirus tracking app is the first link here. The second one is a crisis communication power platform app template that the Power uh, Apps team themselves released. So you can find that there on the Power Apps blog. What's new news? What's what's next for Power Apps? Well, in not long from now, what a week, week and a half, April 2, 8 a.m. Pacific time, really encourage you to go tune into this virtual webcast where Microsoft reveals what's next for Power Apps. So that should be a lot of fun for all of us. 
Um, I've also got um, something that I worked on with my team and created, and I've had a lot of people email me or send me comments on YouTube, so I thought it was worth putting on here as well. You can see in the two animated GIFs that I have on this slide at the bottom, they are of a power app, and the one on the left, it's a single line text control. On the one on the right, it is a multi-line text control. Both of them have a copy button that you see next to them. And what that copy button does is it allows you to copy the contents of what's in those controls and put it on your clipboard. And then as you can see in my little demo graphics, I just go and I paste it into Notepad. I love this feature in the Azure portal. I use it there constantly as I develop in there. And I thought to myself, I'd really like this in Power Apps. So as I went to try to see how I could build it, I found out you need to make a PCF control. So I wrote the PCF control, I wrapped it in a solution, and it's available for download. All you have to do is download the solution, plug it into your environment, and add these controls to your Power App, and they'll work just like this too. So I wanted to tell everybody about that. And if you want to work on the code, uh, it's all in GitHub. So if you'd like to enhance it or do different controls or add to it, welcome your input. All right, next. Community contributions, everybody on this list here tweeting with the Power App CC hashtag here. And, and I've seen the Power Addicts hashtag for a long time be a great way to do a cry for help on Twitter. It sees, seems like our hashtag here is starting to do the same thing too. And I'm seeing lots of great people sharing what they're doing with this hashtag and helping each other out. So thanks to all these folks. Many joined us here on the call today or I saw them in chat. I would also like to start letting everyone be aware of all the other things going on in the community with Power Apps too. And I don't know how I didn't have this in our presentation before, but it's certainly going to be part of what we do going forward. The first one, if you haven't heard of this, it's called the Power Addicts Hangout. And the next one is on April 14. You can go to this website right here. And I saw Vivek right there. Yep, there's Vivek in the chat. He is the one who started all this. So. You can also get all kinds of great things about Power Apps in the call that is done with the Power Addicts. So I try to get in there and every month it seems that that call takes place when I'm out coaching practice. So maybe this month since practice is off for the time being. Great stuff going on there. Another video series just launched, this one by Donna and Sarah. And it looks to me like they record this one in the Channel 9 studio, and it's called the Less Code, More Power video series. And you can go to this link right here in YouTube, and you can watch. They have three episodes so far, and I believe they're shooting for a cadence of one per week. And so this call, the Power Addicts Hangout, as well as Donna and Sarah's call are all basically doing the same thing. They're getting people who love Power Apps together to show each other what they're working on and to help each other learn and unblock each other. So if you can't get enough Power Apps, definitely this call is not your only outlet. Go check these other out too. Bunch of really smart folks doing really good stuff. Finally, I would just like to say thank you Thank you to all of you for tuning in today and asking questions and being part of chat. Thanks to everybody for answering questions. Thank you to Reza, Sancho, and Matt for taking your time. I know you put a lot of time in ahead of time to prepare to do this today and worked on the things you did as well. We all appreciate it. This recording will soon be available on our Microsoft 365 developer YouTube channel. You can also follow that handle on Twitter. And we hope we can see you all next month on April 15 at 8 a.m. Pacific time. Chuck, do you have any closing thoughts this month? Yeah, we didn't tell them what we're going to do next month, and I'm excited about it. That's right. Go for it. So me and Todd actually have been longtime pundits for using application insights for doing monitoring and telemetry or applications. And me and him are going to do a back-to-back -back session on that. And then Donna's going to join us. I'm super excited about that. And she's going to walk through one of her favorite topics, we think, which is actually going to be trending and actually where can you get find out more about Power Apps. So she's actually been working on with the Learn guys, and she's going to walk through how you can actually learn about Power Apps. Um, one of our core passions as well, but, but we're going to leave that to Donna because actually Donna has actually been really raising that flag. One last thing that I actually did last night 
was I created a brand new gallery. That we've been pointing to galleries all day and with the component galleries and the sample galleries. Matter of fact, Res's sample, I moved over into this brand new gallery and it's actually the emergency response gallery. So with this time that we're in right now, there's a bunch of apps around communicating and actually disseminating information, maybe doing hospital beds. I know that my team's working on three or four. And I wanted to actually put a place for once my team's done with one of those, where you guys can go out and reuse those, just like what Sancho was talking about. The last thing we want you to do is reinvent the wheel when you can go out and add new value. So um, that link is where you can find Rez's amazing coronavirus tracking app. You can go out and get the daily updates for the Power BI sample report, the crisis communication application template that I, Todd just showed. And then I think Todd may actually have something for us to show next month. So hopefully that in this space. So hopefully we can actually look at that, Todd. Anyways, yeah, I'm going to give it back to you to close. And uh, also next month, uh, Dawid's going to be showing up too to demonstrate his components and then hook that in with App Insights after we go through that as well. So that's going to be pretty exciting news there. A couple last notes based on what I'm seeing in chat here. Matt asks, what about the Camtasia contest? And so what we're going to be doing is going back through uh, afterward and just doing a random drawing at that point. Uh, for who wins that. And then we will announce that when we post the recording as well as the, the blog post that follows up on this particular call. And there is also a message here from Vivek regarding uh, speaking on the Power Addicts Hangout. And I would like to pile on top of that for this call too. So if you've got something cool you did and you'd like to show it, to everybody else or talk about what you did, please feel free to reach out to Vivek or me or Chuck on, on Twitter or anywhere else you can find us online. And we would be happy to get you on the call and help you show off the cool things you're doing. All right. Well, that will do it then for this month. Turned out to be a long call, almost an hour and a half today, but I hope you all enjoyed it and you all stay safe out there and healthy. We'll see you next month.